Welcome to Tal Capes. I'm Cody Nestor. He's Todd Hill. What's going on, guys? And today we're here to talk about the story of Batman Hush Part 4. This is the final part of our series. We're going to go through the final part of the story and then give you our review at the end. If you haven't watched Parts 1 through 3, go ahead and uh, pause this video, check those out, and then come back. We're going to jump right into it here, Todd. We're going to pick up uh, where we left off with our story. We're actually at an interlude called The Cave. Okay. What's going on in The Cave? So this is basically just a few pages, kind of a bridge and a gap between the issues. I think this maybe originally appeared like maybe in Wizard Magazine. Mm, yeah. Not a hundo on that, but. <laughs> I, th I think so, yeah. If I remember, I think this was part of Wizard Magazine. Yeah. This is basically just uh, more uh, going in depth on Bruce and Selena's relationship. You know, he's told her his true identity. Now he's brought her into the cave. He's, she's in the inner sanctum. Uh, there's some cool scenes here where uh, Batman's sitting there shirtless and he's kind of taken aback by all the scarring on his body. Uh, she sees a few familiar scratches, or they should be familiar to her on his chest. Yeah. She's like, what about those? He's like, you don't remember? <laughs> you gave them to me. Yeah, we get some of those, like, Jim Lee, kind of uh, a little bit differently done watercolor kind of yeah. panels. We get we get one with the Joker, like looks like he put a meat hook in Batman's shoulder. We get a couple, looks like Two-Face firing a couple 45s in the Batman's back. And then yeah. we get the uh, the classic costumed uh, Selena Kyle and Batman. She's, like, slashed across his chest. But, yeah, this is just um it's a good character setup it's just a nice little kind of break a little palate cleanser like to set up the relationship again like you said continuing between bruce and selena yeah. you also get some good dialogue some banter back and forth between alfred and selena just like you you would think that alfred would be not so much on board with batman bringing selena kyle known criminal known thief down to the bat cave yeah. but it's actually the opposite in this case he actually thinks that it could be good for her Bruce to have Selena to have someone in his life. So again, just a, a good way to kind of set up some characterization, kind of build out, take a little break from the action. Cause it's been the last few issues been pretty action heavy. A lot of six, six fourteen, a lot of stuff action with the Joker, six fifteen, six sixteen, a lot of really action heavy stories. So going into this interlude, it's a nice little break, a little palate cleanser before we go into six seventeen, which we'll talk about now. So we go into our next chapter, which is called the grave. So Todd, what happens in the grave? So we basically pick back up. We're still in the cave. Uh, Selena's still down there. We see Bruce. He's kind of underneath the back computer, like he's he's digging for something. He's looking for something. Maybe something was in it. Something's been done to it. Uh, Selena kind of gets distracted. She kind of sees something out of the corner of her eye. She kind of flips up into the shadows and starts having a tussle with Robin. Yeah, so we got uh, Tim Drake Robin. So our, I guess, third canonical Robin, I guess, I technically, guess if, you if, if you don't. If you leave out I, Carrie Kelly. Yeah, I, guess, I was going to say, if you, if, you, yeah, if you don't consider her canonical. So, yeah, Tim Drake Robin, he kind of comes out of the shadows. Kind of they have a little tussle back and forth. There's a lot of, like, I'll clip your wings for you, little birdie yeah. kind of stuff. Obviously, he doesn't understand why. Catwoman, Selena Kyle, is in the Batcave. Yeah. And we see kind of Bruce kind of reveals that he kind of breaks up the the fight between the two of them. He kind of reveals to Tim that he's actually made the decision. He's it, She's his guest. He's actually made the decision to uh, reveal his identity as Bruce Wayne to her, uh, which is, of course... As Tim is uh, very taken aback by, I would right. say. But he's revealed that he's made that choice. He tells uh, Tim Drake that it was his choice to make. Tim seems a little discouraged by it, but what are you going to do? Bruce is a grown-ass man. <laughs> right. Uh, but, yeah, this is where kind of Catwoman tells him, you know, for a man who supposedly is a loner, you've got an awful lot of strings. Yeah. She decides to... Uh, I guess take off on one of the bat bikes. She's kind of had enough. She yeah. wants to get a little bit of air. Right. She takes off on the bat bike, and then uh, what happens from there, Todd? So uh, Tim kind of turns to Batman, and he's like, uh, you, you think she fell for it? Because, you know, we're kind of led to believe that he knew all along that, you know, Selena had been, you know, let in on the secret. She knew, he knew that, you know, Batman had told her. And I think Batman's kind of let her kind of go out and maybe kind of on a little trust miss and see if she can truly be trusted. Right. There's a panel here, too, where uh, he's, he's kind of, they're kind of revealing and talking to each other, and Batman's kind of holding something. It seems like something he may have found in uh, or underneath the Bat computer. Yes, he's got something in his hand. Yeah, yeah so that just tuck that away for uh, right. for next time. We see Catwoman scrawling uh, ass around the streets of Gotham, and she gets passed uh, by Huntress on her... Yeah. Uh, she cuts her off. Yeah, she cuts her <laughs> off on her, uh, on her Huntress bike. Catwoman 
going to follow her into uh, presumably a local cemetery, Gotham Simmons, uh, Gotham City Cemetery, perhaps. She follows her in there, and then uh, Catwoman, in her conversations with Huntress, kind of notices that she she's a little off. She's uh, she's talking a little bit out of her head. She ain't quite herself. Yeah, she's uh, she's a little off from her normal self. And then we get this great kind of splash page where Huntress actually kind of opens fire on Catwoman. Catwoman kind of dodges it. Um, and you know we've mentioned so much about the art in this in this book you know thus far but you know if the story's not been a selling point to you then i think the art should be definitely you don't really get much better than this in the world of comics back in 2002 2003 no way. you don't really get much better than that today in 2024 either and i really like this panel not only for like the composition and everything but also i love the little effects around the the empty spent cartridges they're fine the kind of like the blur effect used around that right uh but Catwoman, she thinks she's fighting huntress huntress who does she think she's fighting she thinks she's fighting, I guess it's maybe an older version of herself. She looks like she's maybe having a battle with herself. <laughs> yeah, like a uh, kind of older in terms of like a, a previous or maybe a past self, like a, a herself that she's kind of maybe uh, thinks she's evolved beyond. Because I don't really know much about the Huntress character, but, you know, from what I gather, the context here is that she kind of... Uh, she sees this version of herself as the old her. Maybe right. she's had some some bad stuff happen, done some bad things, had yeah. some skeletons in the closet, and she's moved past the version she's seeing that she thinks she's fighting the demons uh, in her closet, so to speak, that she thinks she's fighting. She's uh, basically viewing Selena as that, I would say. In this, right, projecting in this, it onto her. Yeah, exactly, projecting it onto Selena. Batman... Uh, Tim Drake, they're Robin, they're both watching this from uh, up above. Batman's like, you know, Catwoman can handle herself, but the way Huntress is going about her business, Huntress might actually force her, Catwoman to kill her. Batman jumps into action leave Rob, and leaves Robin alone, and uh, somebody pops up here with uh, Robin. Yeah, it's our old uh, bandage face protagonist. Yeah, uh, the man in the trench yeah. coat. He kind of punches him in the face and kind of whispers pretender. Yes, <laughs> so uh, Batman tosses uh, Catwoman uh, some sedative to take the Huntress out. Uh, we also see some uh, uncoming uh, headlights looking at Batman and Catwoman. Who's uh, who's who's taking Huntress's bike, Todd? So, uh, somebody comes squalling in on her bike, and it's old Jonathan Crane, the scarecrow. Yeah, Batman says psychiatrist turns psychopath. He comes in singing uh, a familiar lullaby to all of us, mostly uh, everybody would know Hush Little Baby, Don't That's Say right. a Word. Yeah. He comes in uh, singing that song, Batman and him have a, a good tussle, you know, mm -hmm. uh, back and forth here. Some good action. Batman's kind of... Uh, laying a beat down on Jonathan Crane, obviously Scarecrow, not physically a match for Batman. Right. He does pull out some type of, uh, I guess, uh, his uh, Scarecrow toxin, his fear toxin in the form of a piece of straw, piece of hay kind in his hat. snaps it. Snaps it, pops it in Batman's face. Uh, he kind of remarks that um, Batman should be feeling the effects of it, but he's not. Like something else is like altering his mind to not uh, allow yeah. the fear toxin to like, actually take hold. So that's something else to kind of... Uh, kind of file away. File there. away, yeah. Batman rips uh, Scarecrow's mask off, tells him it's over, kind of wants to get answers from him, and then out of nowhere it gets hit with a uh, look, what looks like a batarang with a top. small, small compact-sized batarang. Yeah, so uh, what's going on with the batarang? Who threw it? What's going on there? So that was thrown by our bandaged face, uh, Hush, or, yeah. or is it Hush? Because once he starts, uh, that's where he reels, you know, throws that battering. He's kind of standing there holding Robin, and uh, he starts unveiling his bandages and unwrapping his face. And uh, it's a long thought dead character, Jason Todd. Alive. Yes, Jason Todd, <laughs> uh, former Robin. For those who may not somehow know, I'm sure if you're watching a video about Matt Batman Hush, you're probably pretty familiar with the Batman mythology, but Jason Todd, the second Robin, famously beat to death by the Joker and his crowbar and uh, right. the death in the family storyline back in the 1980s. But he's here, domino mask and all, a little gray in the hair. He's presumably back. Yeah. Back and, from the uh, dead. This is a uh, just to interject. This is, I think this is a badass look for Jason Todd. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and it kind of it plays on the kind of the stuff we've seen. Now, obviously, the trench coat and stuff, but you've seen uh, Hush at times be seen in that kind of like it's almost like I don't know what you call it, like a tactical sweater, right? A tactical turtleneck, tactical top. turtleneck. <laughs> yeah, um, but then here you see that it's kind of open and it's, he's he's brandishing the the Robin R on his chest here, and uh, you know we'll get into what's actually going on here, but yeah, this the the panel here where he's holding the. Uh, the batarang to, to uh, Tim Drake's neck, and then uh, in standing in front of uh, his open grave, here lies Jason Todd. Again, the art here is fantastic. But Badass the, panel. The uh, <laughs> the look for Jason Todd. Um, you know, we'll get into 
the actual what's behind this, but I mean, as far as how you would depict this character coming back after all these years in this story, I think it's, I think it's pretty great. And this is actually where we end, uh, six seventeen, the grave going into six eighteen. Uh, what did you make of this issue? Just overall thoughts before we move quickly into the other one. Uh, I mean, we're down to our final three, and this yeah. is this is definitely a badass ramp up. It's we're here. <laughs> I remember back in the day when we, you know, we we've talked before about you know we stayed up all night talking about like who this could be. This was yes. a possibility that people bat you know bandied around back in the day. Right. Everybody was like, oh, it's obviously Tommy Elliot. Then Tommy Elliot's taken off the table. He's dead in the story at this point, mm-hmm. and people were suggesting. And there was hints. There's a lot of like Robin red herrings, like we talked about before. The Robin sign on the building behind Batman. Right. And there's little red herrings that it was just to kind of almost subliminally, I messed that word up, <laughs> subliminally to kind of lead you to believe that it may be Jason Todd. Jason Todd esque. And I remember that was even in 2002, 2003, everybody kind of speculated this was kind of like everybody was kind of ready for this reveal, reveal to be like, oh, it's Jason Todd. He's back. Right. He's back. And, it, and uh, I was on board with it in the story of how it was going. I mean, I think uh, we'll, we'll figure out and see what's going on in 618. But as right. far as like a, oh man, like, a uh, hook for what's going to come next. I think it's maybe the biggest hook we've got so far. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. Definitely, and it's, it's awesome. <laughs> for sure. So let's move into our next chapter. Uh, we're going into our chapter called The Game. What's happening in the game? So we pick back up. We're right at the graveside again. Uh, Jason Todd and Batman are having some banter back and forth. Uh, he's talking about, you know, possibly slitting this pretender's throat, killing Tim. Uh, he's like, tell me, Batman, you let one Robin die. You want to go for two? I love, too, the the kind of the internal narration Batman has. Is You know, it's kind of, you know, Jeff Lope is kind of acknowledging, like, it's possible for people to come back to life. Right. It happens all the time in yeah. comic books. Batman says Superman died, Green Arrow died, and they're alive today. So, right. like, this is not unheard of. It's a little bit, it's almost meta in a way. Right. It's almost like fourth right. wallish, but I just yeah. kind of, I kind of like, you know, like that kind of inclusion. So they're continuing to battle. They're uh, continuing to uh, to trade punches, trade blows. Uh, just some great battle scenes right here at the graveside. Yeah, this a lot of this is in the first part of this book. It's very very action heavy. It's a lot of going back and forth between Batman and Jason Todd. This Jason Todd trying to kind of get into to Batman's head, uh, you know, thinking and also Batman knowing that he's trying to get into his head. He's right. trying to throw me off. Off my game. Uh, there's also a couple panels here, also too, that I really like from the Batman's internal narration, where he he talks about the uh, the terrible irony is that when Jason died in the madness of grief, I actually considered putting Jason in a Lazarus pit myself, because that is the the context here within the story of Hush is that seemingly Jason Todd has been brought back to life by the use of the Lazarus pit. Right. There's still the question of who would have dug him up and put him there. Right. But at this point, you're not really focused on that. You're just no. like, oh, holy shit, Jason Todd's back. Like, we're we're like we're, yeah. You know, a Lazarus pit was used. Here's Jason Todd alive. We're led to believe, hey, this is who was dunked in that pit. Now, who done it? We don't know. Right. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> right now in the context of the story, you think Jason Todd is Hush, but who is pulling the strings behind Hush? Right. So, you're, 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 this is where you kind of come to uh, into the story. And again, it's just like great characterization and like a great, a great way to kind of like pull this character back into. Uh, the, the the narrative and the mythology of Batman because famously this was for years Jason Todd was one of those like undisturbed unalive characters they right. they left him dead he stayed dead from the 1980s until the he come back soon after this story because I yeah. think this piqued fans interest yeah to be like maybe we should actually bring this right. character back everybody seemed to like his inclusion and in, in hush uh, he was it wasn't long after the story actually was published that he actually come back to life but uh yeah long stayed dead for over 20 years yeah, it was like one of those things that kind of defined Batman this was like his ultimate failure his greatest failure was letting a Robin die. And this story definitely uh, looks at it from that perspective of yeah. Batman's greatest failure being letting Jason uh, Jason Todd die. So uh, what else do we got here, Todd? So they're continuing to battle, uh, continuing to struggle, and I think at some point Batman kind of starts to realize that something's up with Jason. Uh, his moves are moves that really aren't characteristic of Jason Todd. He's not really fighting as himself. Yeah, it seems he says, Batman says, the moves seem very familiar. He also uh, kind of remarks that he is he, he is and looks very much the same age as Nightwing. 
Right. Uh, which is something, another context clue that you'll kind of get here. But yeah, his his moves are very familiar to him. He all, all, also has like the coordination, the speed, the acrobatics, and also the look is also all very familiar, almost like it's choreographed, almost right. like it's um, not quite what it would appear on the surface, Tyne. Right. So what uh, what happens here once uh, Batman and uh, Jason Tyne keep pummeling each other for a little bit longer? So uh, you kind of keep fighting, keep pummeling, and we start to see Jason's face kind of start deteriorating, kind of starting to melt away, which kind of leads us to an old Batman villain we know and love as Clayface. <laughs> yes, so it's, it's revealed here, and there's a couple There's a couple things, too, I'll point out. Like I really I liked, and they're kind of going back and forth. There, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a mention of uh, the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Purloined Letter, right. which is about um, basically the very first detective story about the, you know, the, the answer being in plain sight right. kind of thing. And also, too, um, Batman starts to kind of... Uh, uh, reminisce, not so much reminisce, but recall what has been happening in his life. Uh, it was a battering that actually cut the uh, the bat line. True. Instead of uh, it being uh, you know a bullet or anything else, mm-hmm. it was a battering that cut it. He was designed. It was all planned out for him to fall into Crime Alley where he first met Jason. Right. Jason was stealing the uh, left front tire off of the Batmobile. Mm-hmm. That was the tire that was shot out by. Uh, our hush, our mystery villain. That was the one that was shot out when Batman was chasing Croc when it blew out. So you get those kind of like callbacks here, kind of setting things up. But yeah, it is actually revealed that while Batman is pummeling his face, he's actually not been pummeling the resurrected Jason Todd. He's actually been pummeling good old Clayface. Good old and, Clayface. Uh, just one of those things to file away. Just remember that Clayface is in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> he's around. He's around. He's around. How, you know, spoiler alert, how long has he been around? We'll see. We'll see, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then, too, Batman kind of mentions it. it's even possible that this imposter did not know that Jason Todd was Robin. He could have been told to put on a costume and come to this open grave, given what to say up to a point. True, true. He never referred to himself as Jason, and I never called him that either. So it seems like yet another pawn in the game, another uh, – Another curveball thrown Batman's way to throw him off his game. Right. To remind him of his greatest failure. Um, it turns out to be Clayface. And now we're still no closer to figuring out who Hush actually is. We're kind of back to almost square one. We have a lot of clues and we're kind of back yes. to square one about who is Hush. So uh, you want to continue us on from here, Tom? So uh, Batman has a little uh, talk with Catwoman. She kind of says, you know, you know, for what it's worth, I'm glad it wasn't Jason. He's like, I'm not. She's like, oh. He's like, because that means whoever's responsible for this is still out there. Mm-hmm. And he goes next to, uh, it's the clock tower, right? He talks to Oracle. Clock tower of Oracle, yeah. And this is where we kind of get some more other information, too, about uh, some information that Oracle has kind of uh, come up with, some uh, a loose end that she's been kind of falling back on. And uh, also to- starts to bring back the name Tommy Elliott again. Yeah, she's like, uh, you know, uh, why were you thinking about Tommy Elliott when you got injured? And he's like, why? And she's like, well, you know, that little device you found on the back computer, I did a little researching, and uh, it's a, you know, very, very piece of uh, advanced technology. Yeah, electronic relay, yeah, yeah. she says. And she's like, uh, just take a look at what it can do, and you get a shot of, nice shot of Batman looking at a screen, and or he's just like, <laughs> open mouth like, <laughs> it's like it's like home alone like, like ah, fuck. yeah that's what happened yeah. so and it doesn't we don't actually see what he's looking at right, right. now but from there batman heads to uh a uh the uh, gotham city bridge the uh oracle's kind of set up to have it closed until 6 a.m uh and he kind of starts putting this together like again he re- he's re- he's recalled the sword that was put in um, by Roz into the Batcave. True. It was left in the console. At first, he thinks the placement of it was just... Random. Random. That actually ended up being the placement of where that electronic emitter was. Right. He starts to, I guess, in his mind, boil down to who could have placed that device, who had access to the Batcave to put that in there. Because now we're, we're talking to a point where not only does... At this point, the person that has has is behind all this has to know Bruce Wayne is Batman. Right. At this point, there's no other, there's no other scenario that, right. that someone doesn't know his identity and who could have, who close to him or who within the Batman family could have planted that device inside the Batcave. And so now we're at the Gotham city bridge. 
Again, Oracle has it closed until 6 a.m. And uh, Batman meets with a, a trench-coated figure. Yes. A little bit. Not bandaged and not cloaked, but who is our actual trench coat man this time around, So Todd? this one may be a bit of a deep cut, if you're not yes. familiar with some, uh, I'd I re- say, 90s Batman comics. Yeah, I remember reading this, and I'm like, <laughs> well, the first time, I was like, who the fuck is Harold? But it's Harold. And if you go back, if you're not familiar with some, I think I would say early 90s, uh, mid 2000s, maybe, or maybe even before that, maybe just into the 90s, Batman kind of took on this kind of, he was a deformed, kind of almost a Quasimodo looking type character. Yeah, he's kind of depicted like yeah. that in one of the frames later. And uh, he kind of brought him into the cave, uh, gave him access. You know, he was a he was a quick minded person. He could fix anything, you know, vehicles. He could work on the back computer. He was a sharp witted. <laughs> And he had access. <laughs> Batman wanted to take him in and thought he could kind of give him a life and give him purpose. Mm. And he tried. Harold is depicted as mute. He was never able to speak. And Batman, you know, again, brought him in, tried to give him a life, give him a purpose, give him something to do. And also tried his best to try to see if he could heal his body. Uh, Batman says, when I first met Harold, he was all alone, friendless, homeless, but gifted when it came to the repair of machines and electronics. For a long time, he worked in the cave, access to the cars, the computers, always silent in many ways, as alone as when I found him. Uh, but Harold can speak now, apparently, yes, Todd. Yes, it's important to note that this Harold has been uh, fixed up, patched up, looks good, and can talk. So, yeah, Harold p- pretty much kind of reveals to him that someone approached him that promised that they could uh, heal his body in a way Batman could. Batman gave him a purpose, gave him a job, you know, presumably some some scratch, some ducats yeah, right. for you know repairing the Batmobiles and yeah. things like that. But he couldn't fix him, uh, his body, he couldn't turn him from being mute. But someone approached him to do that and promised him that if he did something for them, that they would heal him, which they did. And what they wanted him to do in return was to plant that electronic relay inside the Batcave, right. which he did. And as we're kind of get to the point where Batman is asking Harold, who put you up to this, what happens, Todd? Uh, Harold never gets a chance to answer because he gets one in the head and one almost looks like right through the throat. Yeah, yeah right through the throat <laughs> or shot. to the chest or to the heart, something like that. He gets a couple uh, 45 slugs right through his chest from, again, now Hush, our bandaged protagonist, uh, or antagonist, I should say, is on the scene now. And he's kind of revealing some more about our plot here. But before we go into that, Todd, that is the end of this issue That is the end of 618, another major hook. We figured out that Batman has found that device. Mm. Someone close to Batman has betrayed him. A bit of a deep cut. A bit of a deep cut, yeah. (laughs) Again, I was uh, a 13-year-old when I read this, and I had no idea who Harold was. Over the years, I've I've, I've uncovered the character and and read more about him and understand a little bit now in the context of the story. Yeah, definitely a deep cut Mm. if you were back in the day or potentially now if you're reading this story. But yeah, a, a close confidant of Batman that was a mute person that was brought in to help Batman to service the cars to keep everything up and running has betrayed him in return for being fixed for uh, being uh, able to have his body healed by again our mysterious bandaged trench coated man who we still do not yet know who that person who is, is. Uh, as we move into issue 619 the last True. issue for Hush <laughs> Todd that kind of kind of really sucks but we we move into the last issue our last chapter is called The End what happens in the end, Todd? So we're uh, back up on the bridge, and uh, Batman is having a confrontation showdown with our masked Hush. And he's uh, he's kind of, uh, you know, uh, laying down some, uh, I guess it was Batman says Aristotle-type yeah, so quotes. He's laying down some Aristotle. <laughs> Along with some gunfire. Yeah, but he's laying yeah. down some Aristotle, and Batman's like, who do I know that does Aristotle? Maxi Zeus? Yeah, he says, <laughs> we should behave to our friends as we would wish our friends to behave to us. Yeah, I like that part, too, where Batman's like, who who would be quoting Aristotle? Maxi Zeus? Uh, you know, who, who would I have that would be quoting Aristotle? We also see some more, uh, obviously, Batman is kind of, uh, he's distracted because Harold is obviously laying dead on the ground now. Right. He's kind of reminiscing about where he first kind of met Harold. It says years ago, Harold was found wandering in the streets by the penguin, taking advantage of his loneliness. The penguin used Harold's unique abilities to aid in criminal activity. I'd hoped to have broken the pattern of Harold's trust in those who did not merit it. And then we get our very, uh, very Quasimodo like panel here in right, this flashback. Right. Says he was invaluable to me as a mechanic in the cave. I gave him unfettered access to the computers. But in his silence, there was a yearning to repair his body and voice. 
one which my true enemy took advantage of and Harold betrayed me. It cost him his life. And we see, again, uh, Hush, our, our uh, antagonist here, trench coated man, is laying down some fire. Take us through this, Todd. I'll let you kind of uh, give us the meat of the story and what's going on here. So we've got, uh, again, uh, Batman in combat with Hush. Uh, you know, Batman's uh, throwing in some hails of batarangs. Uh, Hush is laying down some fire with his gun. Kind of getting, uh, Batman gives him a big ass kick to the face. We get that nice detail on Batman's boot. Looks awesome. Oh, yeah. As <laughs> always, the uh, the details, the little extra details you get in Jim Lee's uh, artwork here that a lot of people didn't go into the effort to do back then or today. Also, like that Batman mentions, like the trench coat Hush is wearing. It's just so generic. He's seen Killer Croc wear one. Jim yeah. Gordon's w- wore one. The fake Jason Clayface wore one. Harold wore one. He even says Bruce Wayne owns a couple. Yeah. It's like so, just like uh, so undistinct, so like generic. Like there's nothing that s- stands out about this person. Like they've perfectly kind of hidden every detail of their identity until until this point. As it's, uh, we kind of see things unfold here. Batman finds something around the uh, the culprit's neck. Yeah, he gets in close and starts landing some punches. And uh, at one point, that trench coat kind of falls a little bit open, and he sees that green pendant necklace. I think it was a gift from Tommy Elliott's mother to Tommy. Yes, yeah. We and see he's that like, where did flashback. you get this? <laughs> yeah, and so uh, he uh, he starts kind of narrating to himself. Um, Hush says Bruce. He actually says Bruce to him. He says he knows who I am. He tells a story only Tommy and I would know. Yeah. So many deceptions. Thomas Elliott is dead. And uh, Batman is kind of like, why? You know, he's asking, why hide your face? Who are you? And then he kind of starts to reveal what happened. Uh, Hush says, do you think it was by coincidence that we're here on this bridge on a rainy night? We get that flashback to young Thomas Elliott that we'd seen previously in the early issues where you come to Wayne Manor in the dark of night. His parents had been in a, in a tragic mm-hmm. accident. Uh, and uh, here Batman is kind of telling him Thomas Wayne did everything in his power to, to save the Elliots. He couldn't save his father, but he saved his mother. What's the problem with that, Tommy? Uh, that's not what Tommy wanted. He, <laughs> he reveals that, you know, he was the one that told the chauffeur or convinced the chauffeur to stay home that night. He had actually cut his parents' brake line on their car. He wanted his parents to die. Yeah, he says, I was never angry that your father let my father die on the operating table. It was that he let my mother live. And, uh, again, this is pretty much... We're, we're, we're in here. We're, we're pretty much 95% sure at this point it's finally Tommy Elliott. It is Tom. Hush was Tommy yes. Elliott. <laughs> uh, he says, I insisted their driver stay home that night, a rainy night, a severed brake line. I wanted my parents to die, Bruce, and your father ruined that. Now, one thing I was kind of thinking about, not to take away from this story, but I'm mm-hmm. like, why did, how did this little 10-year-old convince, <laughs> convince the chauffeur to stay home that yeah. night? Did he like, it's an extra hundred. Here's my allowance from this week. Yeah. It's don't drive my parents Stay tonight. Stay home tonight, yeah. Dobbs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't drive my parents around. Anyway, that's that's a very, very small nitpick. Uh, we see behind Batman that uh, the uh, Batmobile actually explodes. Yes, yeah, blows I, up. I think Tommy actually mentions that uh, uh, he uh, Batman, he didn't see uh, Tommy actually strap the C4 to the Batmobile when uh, him and Harold was having their kind of short-lived reunion. And... Uh, we have some other people show up here on the bridge, too, now. It's getting yeah, a, to yeah. be a hot scene here. Getting crowded on the bridge tonight. Who else shows up, Todd? Uh, it's, I guess at this point, he's former Commissioner Gordon, the best I can remember, mm, yeah. and uh, newly-faced Harvey Dent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, newly pa- uh, plastic surgery Harvey Dent, no longer two-faced, fully fully Harvey Dent. So James Gordon is showing up, Harvey's showing up, and uh, Hush tells Harvey, what are you doing here? You know the agreement. Harvey says, yeah, well, and uh, blast a couple 45 slugs into uh, Hush's Hush, chest. Yeah. And uh, uh, Harvey says, any good lawyer will tell you agreements were meant to be broken. And uh, after Harvey kind of shoots Hush, that kind of knocks him back off the bridge. Batman jumps in the water to try to find what happened to Tommy. Did he get away? Where is he? Batman engages his night vision, looks around, can't find the no body. Sign. Back on the uh, on the bridge, though, with uh uh, Jim Gordon and Harvey Dent. Jim says, give me the gun. Harvey says, you can have it. It's yours anyway. Jim's like, what? And he's like, I, <laughs> it's like I told you, Jimbo, your old police weapon was used to kill Tommy Elliott. Uh, look, I shot Elliott in the alley. It's how I knew the Joker was innocent. So that was, we'll get into it here in a bigger scale in a minute, but Two Faces' role or Harvey Dent's role in this was to, he was supposed to be in the alley that night to shoot the Clayface impersonation of Thomas, Thomas Elliot. Elliot 
to uh, make it look like the Joker had, uh, in fact, killed Tommy Elliott, but it was actually all along. It was Clayface all yes. along. Clayface all along. <laughs> so uh, we go through, and again, Batman can't find, cannot find Thomas Elliott's dead body. And uh, take us through the last couple parts here before we get into uh, Arkham Asylum, Todd. So uh, we're back up on a rooftop. We've got the, the Huntress and Catwoman again. Uh, they're kind of having some dialogue, you know. Uh, she's Huntress is kind of saying Scarecrow really messed with my mind, kind of a back and forth. Uh, she's kind of Huntress is kind of saying, you know, I heard Thomas Ailey is dead again, <laughs> again. <laughs> right. Catwoman's like, yeah, I heard that too. Uh, Huntress is like, good bastard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this one, I think this says it's what a couple of weeks later after all the events on the bridge, this uh, kind of conversation happens, and then we go back to uh, the, the cave. cave yes. And I really like this interaction with uh, with Batman and uh, and Superman here, but. Uh, Batman is kind of remarking, you know, he's like, I've, I've been to Philadelphia. This is planned for more than a year, maybe two. I keep thinking about the purloined letter, how the answer was there all along. And uh, Clark's like, you know, Bruce, sometimes being a detective, it's like finding your eyeglasses. They're always, you know, in the last place that you look. Right. Uh, but really what kind of comes out of this is, um, you know, Batman, you know, kind of they're talking about how, you know, Thomas Elliott helped Har Harold. He cured him. He cured Harvey Dent. Mm -hmm. He changed him and did plastic surgery on him as well. Uh, he, he actually, too, and Huntress did technically, I guess she did technically betray him, right? Because he, he remarks that uh, the Tommy Elliott actually— and offered her money for uh, better equipment, equipment or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he said he was a concerned citizen and wanted to improve her crime-fighting abilities, and she had him checked out. He was clean. Batman says, I even thought he was clean. But, yeah, she actually did. I mean, she was had been manipulated, too, by Scarecrow and all yeah. that kind of stuff, but she did, in a way, betray him unwillingly or unknowingly for what uh, Tommy's purposes was. But the big thing to come out of this that I really like is kind of in the next page where uh, Bruce asked Clark to— uh, he knows that Tommy Elliott, he was inside his head. He believes that he planted something inside his head. And he has Clark actually look in using his uh, kind of X-ray microscopic vision, he says. And uh, Clark notices there's something at the base of his skull, so tiny. And uh, he says, a homing device? Clark's like, possibly. And he tells him to burn it. I just like that little, and he's like, I could hurt you. He's like, do it. And I like, like that little <laughs> shaking hand. Right. Yeah, just like just that motion on the hand where it's like, you know, <laughs> like just as he fries it out of Batman's head. But yeah, Tommy Elliott, while Batman was under in the hospital, he did actually go in and plant a homing device in the base of his skull. So knowing where Batman was this whole time, able to track his movements. Yeah. So again, just another little layer on this, on this story. There's a lot of layers and we're about to yeah. get into it. And we do finally get to see, uh, you know, he, Batman kind of says to Bruce, I mean to Bruce, to Clark, do you want to see how he got me? And like that the thing that had been planted on the back computer was like subliminal messages. Oh, yes. If you yeah. want to know why out of all those years where he just randomly like, get Tommy Elliott to come fix me. Right. It's because he's been subliminally subjected to Tommy Elliott's image and face right. for like who knows how long That electronic point. relay herald yeah. placed inside the back computer was a some type of device that would subliminally flash Tommy Elliott or his name or a picture of him or something like mm -hmm. that to kind of subliminate so when the time came when the plan was enacted for Batman to fall be injured uh, and need uh, need repairing Tommy Elliott would be who he thought first of first name he thought of thought of alright so we're here in, we go we're in Arkham <laughs> Asylum here so um I guess we should we should just kind of because this is kind of going to be a lot to go through. So basically, we're in Arkham Asylum. Who who is Batman visiting in he Arkham Asylum? Vi because is let, let me just say this: so okay. Hush did not work alone. Yep. So so he was he, he was aided. Yes. Yeah, so helped. so yes, Batman figures out too that that Hush was was not working alone, and he was working with someone, and there was also another puppet master, so to speak. And who is our, our second puppet master here, Todd? He's revealed to be none other than Edward Nigma, the Riddler. The Riddler. So the Riddler is technically really the mastermind that set all this in motion. True. The Riddler only appeared once in issue 615, and if you remember that issue, it was set up that he was, it was uh, the context of it that was, he was so lowly a criminal that he had just kind of been overlooked in all this. Right. That it was like almost an affront to him that Batman kind of remarked, you know, was he not worthy of being included, including in Hush's plans? 
no, that was just another red herring because technically Edward Nigma was behind this the whole uh, thing. the whole way. And we kind of mapped this out to try to kind of piece it together for folks because it, it it is a lot of layers. It's a lot of layers. It's a it's a, it's a big onion with a lot of layers, Todd. <laughs> We're gonna start trying to peel it here for yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> so so if you follow the sequence of events here the way we have it, and we we might have missed something, and if you uh, figure out something we missed or didn't include, let us know in the comments. But basically, it's set up here that the Riddler. Had got cancer. Mm -hmm. Riddler come down with a big C. Got the big C. And he was getting treatment from doctors. And one of them was a doctor in Philadelphia by the name of Thomas Elliott. Thomas Elliott. So he was going to Thomas Elliott for treatment. The Riddler figured a way to cure himself was he knew of the Lazarus pit, Ra's al Ghul's Lazarus pit, and their healing properties. So the Riddler took it upon himself to use and defile a Lazarus pit to cure himself of his cancer. Once Riddler did that, Riddler knew about Tommy and his past, and he knew that his mother had died of cancer, and he was a doctor, and it might be worth a little bit of money if he were to sell back the cure for cancer back to Thomas Elliot. Right. So he approached Thomas Elliot with the cure for cancer. Turns out Thomas Elliot didn't give a shit about the cure for cancer. He knew that the Riddler was from Gotham City and he had a hard on to get revenge against Bruce Wayne. Right. Why did he want to get revenge for Bruce Wayne? Because Bruce Wayne's father I saved like his this. mother and instead of letting them both die, right. which kept Tommy from inheriting their wealth for many, many years until his mother eventually passed away with cancer. So from there, they secretly infected Killer Croc with a virus that would cause him to further mutate, become more animalistic. Mm -hmm. And they also extorted him by saying, we infected you, which he didn't know, but we have a cure for you if you give us money. Right. Because as Riddler says, you can't ever have enough money. Right. So <laughs> now that Riddler was cured of cancer, what does he get out of this? He got he was getting some money, and he was getting the thrill of fucking Batman and something else we'll talk about here in just a second. But... So Croc, that is the reason Croc kidnapped Edward Lamont IV for the ransom money to pay that to Riddler to cure him. Right. And then they had enlisted Jonathan Crane, the Scarecrow, to basically go through Batman's Rose Gallery and figure out who is susceptible, who could be utilized or extorted to help Tommy Elliott and Riddler in their plan and what would they want out of it to get their services, basically. Right. I think this mentioned before, like Harley uh, or no uh, Poison Ivy. You know, it was basically money, and she has a thing about Catwoman. Right. Um, Harley Quinn. She gets to work with the Joker. Mm -hmm. She's in. Uh, Batman says the Joker couldn't have been easy. The Riddler says at first when he heard the Jason Todd gag, he couldn't resist at that right. point. Clayface got involved because again, another as Riddler says, another moron wanting money. Yawn, that kind of thing. Yep. So uh, they, Roz was not involved at all. Roz was actually, basically, Roz was trying to figure out who defiled right. his Lazarus pit. So Riddler pissed Roz off, so he planted the, and back in issue 615, he planted the ash from the Lazarus pit in the back of the armored truck right. to put Batman onto Roz, and hopefully they would take each other out, or he would take Roz basically off the vo mm. off the board, and he was not involved whatsoever. Uh, are you still with me here, Todd? I'm still with are you. you. Still, audience, are you still with me? Uh, I'm, I'm mesmerized, it's, it's a man. Lot. It's a lot. Uh, and then Riddler and Tommy go about inventing the man in the trench coat, who they would call Hush. Right. And they mention Batman's like, why Hush? And because, I guess, Scarecrow was... Uh, going around singing that hush little hush baby, little baby lullaby, and also they would it was like a little in joke would be like hush we can't really talk about this right. we can't you know shut the fuck up <laughs> hush kind of thing right. so the name just kind of sprung out of that and the ultimate riddle the the thing that put everything in motion the, the big part of it is that the ultimate riddle the Riddler figured out because he says with the newfound clarity that the Riddler obtained using the Lazarus pit, it helped him solve the greatest riddle of all, which is who Batman was. And once that was in place, um, they were able to kind of put this all in motion. Mm -hmm. And the last piece of the puzzle that was, it was an earlier piece, but the last piece of the puzzle they didn't really, they didn't really count on is that Thomas Elliot also used his skills as a doctor to um, perform surgery on Two Face right. to cure him from being Two Face and turning back into Harvey Dent. But upon doing so, taking away Two Face and leaving only Harvey, Harvey was the good guy. Right. Harvey was the good side of of uh, Two Face. So so he did 
what they asked him to. But then, as we see earlier, he immediately goes to Jim Gordon, tells Jim Gordon what's going on. They partner together, and the Riddler and Hush didn't count on Harvey Dent taking control right. and being the one that double-crossed them in the end. And really, the the thing that really stopped this plan from kind of coming to fruition, really, it's the double cross of Harvey Dent coming back to the the, the good side right. and putting the kibosh on all this. Yes. <laughs> does that make sense, Todd? It does. And it does. It really does. It does. I was there, but we, we, we sat down and, like, really mapped this out right before we we were, uh, we were sat down to, to record this because I, you know, it's a lot. It's and a I lot. I think you kind of make the comment at first. You, you said at first it seemed maybe a little loosey goosey, but when I did we started too. working yeah, through it, it's I like did it made last sense. night when I was writing our questions <laughs> about like you know there's some stuff I want to ask you about this story. I was like, I was like, is some of this a little hand wavy and a little like, and there are some little parts like I said about how does a ten year old convince um, the butler to stay home right. and not drive. There's another thing that I thought about too, where like Batman's looking at like the autopsy stuff from like. Um, Tommy Elliot, like how did they fake that? Like stuff that you don't get explained as much, but like right. you have so many moving parts here for it to be as tight as it is because like everything I laid out there is pretty much the bullet points. Again, I may have missed something, mm -hmm. but that's pretty fucking tight. Yeah. Like, I mean, there is cause and effect. There's a causality for everything, and yeah. like the big broad brushstrokes can all be explained by what we just went through. And it all works. There may be a little bit of like hand waving here, like don't pay attention so much to what this hand's doing. The yeah. left hand's doing something over here. There's a little bit of that, but like it's still a pretty tight and thought out story. And yeah. I really um, this is the first time I really went back and like read the story and really thought about like what, how everything. It's the first time we've really sat down and like bullet pointed this out to say this right. is what happened. And I think it absolutely holds up. Yeah. To me, it absolutely holds up. And uh, to kind of close this out here, because we're going to talk about a few things, I have a, cu a couple questions for you, Todd. So uh, the big thing is, you know, again, the Riddler knows Batman's secret identity. He right. knows Bruce Wayne is Batman. But Basically, as Batman tells him, the Riddler knows that once everyone knows a riddle, once everyone knows the answer to something, the information becomes useless. So he knows the Riddler's never going to tell anybody. Right. And if he does, he threatens to tell Ra's al Ghul who defiled his Lazarus right. pit. And if he if he did, did decide to get a wild hair and reveal yeah. his secret identity. And uh, what, is, uh, what does Batman do to him right before he, uh, he leaves, though? He socks him right in a friggin' jaw. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, he asks him, too, where's Jason's body? Because Jason's body yeah. was really removed from its grave. Yes. So someone did take Jason's body, and uh, as the uh, the Riddler says, that is a riddle, isn't it? And Batman socks him right in the face. I like that guard walks in. What happened? He, he fell. fell. He fell. He fell. He fell. He fell. <laughs> yeah, he's a battered housewife. Uh, but, yeah, basically Batman says we're done. And our last scene on the hillside, uh, Batman says he buried Harold on a hillside overlooking Wayne Manor. His home was here. I want him to be safe. Took some doing, but I finally found his last name for the marker. I couldn't really read this. Does it say Harold Allnut? <laughs> That's Todd, who is blind. It looks like it says Allnut. <laughs> yeah, as Todd uh, tries to see. I think it says Harold Allnut. I don't really know his last name. What the... I don't know. I'll put I it have there. to get close and peer over. <laughs> and peer over, yeah. Close and peer over. Harold <laughs> Allnut, I think. Uh, but the last part of this, uh, the book here is the conversation between Batman and Catwoman. You want to take us through that, Todd? So they're kind of talking and they're kind of dialoguing back and forth. They're kind of, Batman is trying to figure out, you know, was this real? Was it just a subliminals? Was it, you know, were we both under Ivy's spell? You know, were we real? Were we ever real? Yeah. And she's like, hush. And he's like, why would you say that? Why would you say that? And he grabs her by the hands and, you know, he's hurting her. And she's like, Bruce. He's like, she's like, what? Oh, is, is this over? Are we fucking done? <laughs> right, yeah. I love, too, because he, in, the internal narration is, was she part of this? Can I take that chance? So she, she's kind of like, you know, um, like you said, is it over kind of thing? And she says, listen, I don't, I don't need to know if this started out as a spell. Forget about being a detective for once. We are who we are. That's why this works. Maybe someday you'll come to trust that until then. And then she kind of leaves, and our last panel of the book is um, Batman standing in front of uh, a gravestone, and the narration says, Someday. Someday. And it says, The End, one of the best Batman stories, in my opinion. And we'll talk about it. Um, there is something that I'd never read before. I don't, Todd, I don't think you've ever read it before. Oh, yeah. That, a uh, uh, epilogue. A pro, epilogue. Yeah, yes. called The Aftermath. You want to just kind of quickly explain? This was something that is. 
uh, exclusive to the uh, the 20th anniversary of Hush. This book that we're uh, the version that we're reading is basically a little uh, add on epilogue that Jim Lee created just for this version of the book. So you want to take us through that? So Batman is still kind of he's obsessed with finding Tommy Elliot's body. He's he's diving back down to the water. He's like you know he, he you know what happened to the body? Why can't I find the body? Because mm-hmm. Superman mentions he actually scoured. You know he yeah he looked yeah. vision to kind of scour all over the place to like look through the harbor didn't see anything either and batman kind of comes upon i think it was an old sunken ship or and he kind of he get, goes inside and he kind of sees maybe you know it's like some supplies maybe there was an old aqua lung where he could have kind of hung out for a while yeah he mentions too that it's a uh, it's a, like a luthor boat it's a lead it's got a lead, yeah, hole lead line so uh, that's why superman didn't see it yeah and it's got uh it's like an old luthor boat that they were like you know kind of putting, you know, traveling something around with or whatever. But, you know, Luthor, Lenline, right. Superman makes sense. So we actually see Tommy actually, or Hush Tommy, he's actually leaving the boat and he kind of swims to the surface and runs right up into the middle of Harley and Joker. Harley and Joker, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, Harley says, look, Puddin', the fish are really jumping tonight. And Joker says, what's that old saying? Revenge is a dish best served. Shot in the head. Ha, <laughs> uh, ha, he, he. And then uh, that's our last... Uh, Part of this is Joker gun to Tommy Elliot Hush's head, who has never has his face revealed again. If you notice in the story, his True. his bandages are never removed, so there's still like an element of like, hmm, like we're again. Right, you never see his face, so can you can you be a hundred percent sure, Todd? I know. Now I know there were other. I Hush think Hush or, appeared in other things, yeah. but I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not familiar with those. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I've heard some good stuff about you know some of the other hush stories, but I've never, never read anything else hush was in. The only other thing, any you know, other medium I've seen him in, I think it was part of like maybe the Arkham Knight game and stuff like that. They kind of brought him into. But as far as reading other books involving hush, I never have. But technically, you never see Tommy Elliot's face ever again. So True. I'm not sure what was ever done with that. I guess we'll never know until we read those books, Todd. But yeah. uh, here we are, finally at the end, Todd. Four parts later, we've made it through twelve issues of again. And probably, if not, you know, the one of my favorite Batman books of all time, as I mentioned, the uh, the Batman book that got me into comics, that kind right. of hooked me and kind of kept me in there. Uh, just a couple questions for you before we get into the reviews, Todd. So, um, first of all, how do you think Batman would feel if people didn't uh, like this video and subscribe to the channel? I think, like us, he would be very unhappy. Yeah, I think, I think so, too. So I, I would hit that like button and uh, subscribe to the channel, especially if you're enjoying the video and you're still sticking around with us here. We're about, we're definitely about 50 minutes into this thing. So, uh, Todd, my question here, do you think Hush sticks the landing? Is the ending satisfying? As we kind of laid out a little bit, does it all add up to you? Is it, is it a satisfying conclusion here? You know, I think once we kind of tonight, just before we started, kind of broke it all down, it, it really tied it together i think a lot better when you kind of take a step back than maybe when you initially just read through it Mm -hmm. uh i really do think hush sticks to landing i think i maybe appreciate it now more than i did then right and i mean if you think about it uh kind of to quickly (laughs) when you think about the riddler you really just think about his stick you know he's mm-hmm. you know uh riddles you know he has to always out, out with batman he can't just pull a job he has to give batman riddles to what he's going to do right and you think about he's always very at the forefront of it he's like you always know it's the riddler yeah and you really from there you just kind of go to his uh, live action performances uh you know back in the day frank gorshin from the original tv show 66 uh jim carrey recently paul dano mm-hmm. if you really think about a definitive and not to say this is just purely a riddler story mm-hmm. but if you think about a you know a really honest to goodness good riddler story mm-hmm. i think this is it yeah it's a good <laughs> riddler story that masquerade for 11 issues as a not riddler story true yeah but that actually makes it become a better Riddler Prob- story. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's some stuff with what Riddler and maybe Zero Year that was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and stuff like that. But, I mean, this is definitely one of those that really makes the character, uh, gives him a little bit more of an edge to him, mm-hmm. gives him a little bit more of a, a sinister kind of undertone and, like, really kind of shows, you know, how, how much of a foil and how, like, 
you know, how he could really kind of pull something like this off and gives him a little bit more oomph yeah. to yeah. his character, you know, makes him a little bit more, uh, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is, but, you know, just like I said, adds a little bit more oomph to him, makes him a little bit more. Kind of bumps him up in the rogues gallery, yeah, exactly. I think, a little bit higher than I originally may have given him credit for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he looks like more of a threat to Batman yeah. than this, you know, with his intellect. You know, he might not have the brawn, and, but he's definitely got the brains to pull something like this off, and he's you know, kind of used the muscle and, and Batman's other rogues gallery to like kind of uh, pull this thing off. So yeah, again, I don't, there's not too many Riddler stories that kind of come to mind except for like something like Zero Year. So this has yeah. got to be in that, it's got to be in a top 10 best Riddler stories, I would say. Oh yeah. Like for me, speaking of this is, I'm not going to ask you to rank these Todd, but I'm okay. going to, I'm going to give you, you know, I don't want you to put them in the list to rank them, but I want to give you a few, what I would think everybody would consider kind of all time Batman stories. And you tell me if Hush is better. Okay. Um, is Hush better than The Dark Knight Returns? No. <laughs> I would agree with you there. Is Hush better than Batman Year One? I think that would be another no. I, w- I would agree with that as well. Is Hush better than Batman The Long Halloween? I think it may be another no. <laughs> right. I also would agree. Uh, is Hush better than The Killing Joke? Now, honestly, I always think of The Killing Joke as more of a Joker story. Right. So I may say yes to this one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. Yeah, if I, just, if I take them book versus book, I think... Killing Joke may still be above yeah, it. Yeah, because it's got uh, it's got such a um, it, it's like it, it's one of those books that like like Death in the Family. It's like it changed yeah. the mythology forever, True. you know. Until one day it's retcon. Maybe it's in. Maybe it's not. She can walk now. She you know she couldn't walk now. She can walk. Right, kind right. of thing. As, as comics change, is Hush better than All Star Batman? A thousand times better, yes. <laughs> yeah. That never even finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only made it to any issues. I couldn't disagree more, Todd. Uh, no, uh, yeah, definitely better than All-Star Batman, the next uh, kind of big Jim Lee uh, Batman book that he would kind of take on a few years later. Yeah, so I kind of point that out because, like, Obviously, there are better Batman stories, and there's like I yeah. think I think most people would agree that those four, the first four I mentioned, are probably those would probably make up most people's four out of their top five right. if they had a top five Batman. So I think my argument is Hush is I could I could say could be in the top five. It might take that fifth spot, but it's definitely it's in that six, seven, eight. It's yeah. in the top 10 for sure. It doesn't fall out of the top 10 in, in no way. That I, I was looking see. around last night to just see how people had it. I saw it coming in at 11. I saw a couple comes in at, you know, coming in at 10. I saw some in the 20s, and I'm like, get fucked. I, I <laughs> no, don't know get about f- that. You know, they had, like, stuff like Batman, Red Rain, and, like, ah, Gotham by Gaslight, and, all, okay. and, and, and stuff in front of it. And I'm right. like, those good, you know, Gotham by Gaslight and all that, that's good. But Hush is like, yeah. it's top 10. There's yeah. no, you never one would ever convince me it's not top 10. Yeah, even yeah. with some of the new stuff like you know the the zero years and the court of owls you can still put that in there or yeah. black mirror or some of the stuff that you've seen but like it's it's never not going to be a top 10 batman book to no. me and there may be better batman books and more you know definitive like all timers but like i think it has a solidified place in like that top 10 if you're saying here someone who's never read batman books or wants to know the the best 10 batman graphic novels to read you hand them 10 books you better hand them hush to right that's right. that's my opinion on it uh todd is a batman fan for basically your entire life what does batman hush mean to you personally now 22 years later uh man it's uh it's still a page turner i gotta tell you uh it's just think of back to when i was originally reading this and it was just being put into my pool list every i guess month mm-hmm. it was just it was something that was going instantly to the top I had to read hush first yep and, you know, as we've mentioned before, you know, I was an old comic vet by then. But this was just kind of the story you kind of, I'd stepped out of the room, you just kind of leafing through my pool, pool list for the week. Where's my Cheetos? And you, and you, <laughs> you saw the first issue and, you know, it set yeah. you on the path. 16, actually. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it kind of set you on the path. And it was mm-hmm. like, it was kind of like you had finally aged it to where you were kind of appreciating reading comics along with me. And we were kind of going back and forth. You know, we've mentioned before that famous conversation we had into the wee hours mm-hmm. of the morning mm-hmm. trying to figure out who Hush was. Uh, yep. This, uh, Reading it then, uh, reading it a couple times before, and now finishing up here recently, it still, it still hooks me. It's still a page turner. Yeah. I can start at six oh eight, and I cannot, 
I can probably keep on going. I won't stop till I reach the end. It's that yeah, good to when, me. When we were doing it and reading them like three at a time for each of these episodes, like I wanted to keep going every time. Yeah. Because like even though I know where the ultimate ending is, there's still little stuff that you forget and stuff that you may not have noticed. I wish I'd have wrote it down. There was something I totally did not notice in any of the times that I've read this before, like, you know, that I was going to point out. But unfortunately, I didn't, you know, crack, crack <laughs> cocaine to hell with right. drugs. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just like, you know, 22 years later, it's still, it will always have its place to me is like, you know, again, that story that got me into comics and like, again, um, you know, if there's, there's again, all time Batman stories and things like that. But like, you know, if you'd asked me like what I wanted, if I wanted to, to who I wanted to draw, like, and do like, it would be, yeah. it would be Jim Lee. It would be, you know, I, I would want to, I would want to have his career and everything that he's kind of done. And you know, he's still one of my favorite artists to this day, and that that's not going to change. And I know he doesn't do so much anymore. He's he's head honcho up in the DC ranks these right. days. But, like, this story will always be kind of a classic one to me. And I think if – hopefully if you kind of enjoyed kind of going back through this kind of like as we have, and if you've never read this story, you know, and you've just been listening to this, and I, th- I still think it's worth your time to kind of go back and – yeah, definitely. And read along with it. So, Todd, let's uh, get to the uh, the review scores here. So give me your review score and your final thoughts for Batman Hush. Uh, final thoughts. Are there more iconic and characters finding Batman stories out there? Yes. Uh, you know, I still think that this was a, this was a nice, it was a nice whodunit. It was a nice mm-hmm. mystery. You're trying to unravel a mystery. I think that's what kind of hooks me. Yeah. It's like, you know, the detective side of Batman in a way. You don't really get to see that a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And I think this played out really nicely. I think it definitely does stick the landing. Like I said, I think I appreciate it more now than I did then. Mm-hmm. And I yep. just want to say, uh, for me, I, th- I would say 95 to maybe even 96, 97% of why I read comics is for the art. Mm. I think art can elevate a mediocre story, decent story, to good or great. Yep. Opposite end, I think bad artwork can take an excellent story and knock it down a couple yeah, of pegs. Absolutely. I know people are, there are some people that don't like Jim Lee artwork. Yeah, I, I I love it. I think Jim Lee is one of the best that ever did it. I think you know I don't know if he does a lot of projects anymore. Like you say, he's yeah. one of the main guys in DC. Maybe a cover or two here, or there, or something special. You know, yeah. yeah. I was aware of him before this, but I think Hush is kind of where he he hooked me. I became a lifelong Jim Lee fan. I sought out his projects. I wanted to see what he had drawn or been a part of. Final score for Hush, I think it's an eight. I think it is a great story. Yeah, I um, I was I was interested to see where you you would go with the score here. I mean, I echo everything that you're saying. You know, um, as far as the you know you, the art here, I think the art holds up. I think the story holds up, and I think they're they're perfect kind of partners in this. Mm-hmm. There's not one. There's not one that holds the other back. I think they're both on the same level. Definitely, I think the yeah. story doesn't hold the art back, and the art doesn't hold the story. I think they work great in tandem. Obviously, Je- Jeff Loeb, he's you know coming from that long Halloween background, good mm-hmm. detective Batman stories, and this was kind of that. It's everything you wanted. You got to see all the big characters. You got to see all the villains. Right. You got Superman brought in. It was like kind of like a, a best of a greatest hits. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the Eagles' greatest hits version of Batman story. You know what I mean? It's like everything you would want kind of be thrown at you in a good way to kind of Jim Lee to show off his skills. The first time he comes, you know, basically coming from Marvel, this is his first thing in DC. Yeah. Let's give him the our biggest book, our Batman book. Let's see what he does with it, and you know, kind of knocks it out of the park. And I mean. Um, you know, I've read some other Jim Lee work. I don't know if it ever got better than this, as True. far as as far as just a story altogether. The match of story yeah. and artwork. We yeah. talked about All Star Batman, and it had its problems, and you know, something like Superman Four Tomorrow and stuff as well. Like his DC stuff, you know, after you know, after that kind of mid two thousands, he started kind of going into more executive work right. and kind of left the, the creative side of it behind. So I think this is probably for his DC work. This is probably the pinnacle. This yeah. is probably the peak. So you don't really get much better than this. So 
Uh, I'm really torn between an eight and a nine. I really don't know. Cause like, I'm thinking we've never really reviewed some of these other Batman books. Like, would I give them tens? Would I give them nine? So I think for me, I think I'm going to stick with you as well. I think I'm going to agree with you. I think I'm going to give this an eight okay. as well. I think it's great. And it gives me a little r- more room if we do uh, decide to review some of these other all time Batman books okay. kind of going forward. But if you've never read it, you got to give this a read. Definitely. It's, it's a classic. Again, it's worth every penny to buy it physically, to uh, buy it digitally. You know, just seek this book out. Get it oversized. It. Yeah, yeah. Get the absolute <laughs> yeah. version of it. Like I said, I own about every version of this that you could. So uh, it's been a good, it's been a fun series. It's been a while. Like, it has. We've extended this out during the last part. You know, I'm, I'm kind of sad that it's ending, but again, we'll always have it to kind of go back to and read at our leisure. And I hope you guys have kind of enjoyed coming along for this. And yeah. hopefully we've done it to a service. We've done right by the book. That's what we kind of set out to do is like this was kind of you know to, no matter how many people actually have watched this video or listened to it it was just kind of a passion project for it was our love letter to us yeah exactly <laughs> and we, hope, we hope we did it justice so i think we'll call it a, a wrap on this episode if you enjoyed the video please like and subscribe yeah. feel free to send us an email or get in touch with us on social media as well all the information will be in the bottom of the screen tal capes will return and we want to thank you so much for watching until next time bye guys see you guys